When I saw Elon Musk being interviewed on the Babylon Bee, I had a stack of questions. I thought, what is this? Is this a parody? Is this a joke? Is he a Christian? Does he know this is a Christian organization? And when I saw it was real, I couldn't wait for them to share the gospel. So I fast forwarded, and man, you could feel the tension in the air. The mouths were dry. I know that feeling. Roll Rolex, the peak Rolex, it seems like. And yeah, heyday, yeah. Yeah. Good pick. All right, final question to close All our right. time out here. Yeah, I mean, we're here, we're, you know, the Babylon Bee is a Christian organization, you know, and uh, we're a ministry. Let me take a minute to say I empathize with these guys. Look at who they were talking to. His interest in Mars spawned SpaceX, rockets that can come and go. Lift off, get for five, aim high. Heralding a future of interplanetary travel. And then there is Tesla, his vision for electric transportation that's turning the gas-fueled car industry into a battery-powered future. The person of the year is Elon Musk. Okay. He is reshaping life on Earth and possibly <laughs> life off Earth as well. And, mm -hmm. and this is someone also who in becoming the richest person in the history of the world this year really speaks to the moment we're in, to this very complex moment in the world. Just before we look at what they said to him, let me share with you three keys that have helped me get rid of intimidation when it comes to someone's wealth, their fame, or their intellect. The first key is the knowledge this person is not a beast, as evolution says, but is a human being made in the image of God with a God-given conscience, society-shaped, but God-given. I'm not going to address his intellect, I'm going to address his conscience, that inner knowledge of right and wrong, and that'll echo the truth of the commandments. That puts him on a level playing field. The second key is that he's been given a will to live. Something in him says, I don't want to die. The young man that led me to Christ 50 years ago, his name was Graham Reed, the whole weekend kept repeating the same thing. He kept saying, Ray Comfort, a Christian, I don't believe it. And this is because he wrongly surmised that because I was happy as a non-Christian, I wouldn't be interested in everlasting life. How crazy is that? Because I was happy, I wanted to hold on to this precious life. So when I heard the gospel for the first time, I grabbed it with both hands. He had no idea that despite my success in life, I didn't even know why I was alive. Listen to Elon Musk as he cries out for reality. Do you pray? I don't. I didn't even pray when I, when I almost died of malaria. Wow, that's really not praying. Right. You know, I'm not very religious, but I prayed for this one. Um, I had this like existential crisis when I was a kid and, uh, and tried to figure out what's it all about. And, conf and none of the books I read seemed to actually have a good answer. You know, so I, said, I read all the religious texts and I read a bunch of philosophy books and they're all quite depressing. We don't really know what the meaning of, the, of, the, of life is. Trying to figure out the meaning of life and well, like what does it all mean because uh, it, 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 it sort of seemed quite meaningless. I was trying to figure out what's the meaning of life um, and there didn't seem to be any good answer. I was just very curious about the world and um, what, how do we come to be here, what's the meaning of life and all that and uh, um, I always had a really in intense desire to understand things and learn. Um, yeah, I mean, I had sort of an existential crisis, I guess, when I was I know, 11 or 12 or something, just trying to figure out what it's all about, you know, and uh, ultimately came to, came to the conclusion that um, we don't really know the answer, but, uh, but if we increase the scope and scale of civilization, then we, uh, we have a much better chance of understanding the meaning of life and why, why we're here, or even what are the right questions to ask. Do you believe in God? I believe, I believe there's some, there's some explanation for this universe, which you might call God. The third key is my moral obligation. I'm like a firefighter. I've trained. I'm ready. Any firefighter who shows up at a fire untrained shouldn't be called a firefighter. And the Bible says, study to show yourself approved. A workman needs not be ashamed. If you don't know what to say to the ungodly, it's obvious you've never studied it. Everything you wanted to achieve in life, you studied. You studied how to ride a bike as a kid, how to drive a car. 
You study the things that you wanted to do. And of all the things you should want to do, it's the will of God to seek and to save that which is lost. So be ready. The Bible says, always be ready to give an answer to those who ask of you the hope that's within you. And so I've studied it. I've studied what Jesus did. I've studied the scriptures. I've read the learned men of God that have gone before me. So when I meet an unsaved person, I get to know them. I say, do you think there's an afterlife? And I learn to take them through the commandments to bring the knowledge of sin. Because there's no point in preaching the cross if someone doesn't realize they're a sinner. And we open up the commandments as Jesus did to bring the knowledge of sin so they'll see their need of a savior, so they see their danger. I preach judgment day, talk about the reality of hell unashamedly, tell them that God is rich in mercy, provided a savior who suffered and died on the cross. Oh, we live to preach Christ and him crucified, the most incredible news this world could ever hope to hear. And then we tell them that Jesus destroyed death through the resurrection. We're talking about somebody's eternal salvation, so make sure you avoid the methods of modern evangelism. I'm talking about the unbiblical traditions of asking Jesus into your heart, asking someone if they want to accept Christ, or to pray a sinner's prayer with them. These modern traditions have filled the church with false converts, and they've filled America with what we call bitter backsliders. There's no greater disservice that we can do to another human being than to lead them in a false profession of faith. It's to give them a parachute filled with holes and then pat them on the back as they're waiting to jump. I know because I once did that. If you'd like to see the tragic statistics of what this unbiblical evangelism has done, please take the time to read this free book. Evangelist Bill Fay said, While reading this book, my heart went into atrial fibrillation. It's that good. There's nothing like it. It's truly from God. Todd Friel of Wretched Radio and Wretched TV said, This book is explosive, eye-opening, jaw-dropping, staggeringly helpful. It's short, it's easy reading, and it's completely free. You can read the book freely online at freewonderfulbook.com. Now let's see where this amazing opportunity went. All right, final question to close All our right. time out here. Yeah, I mean, we're here, we're, you know, the Babylon Bee is a Christian organization, you know, and uh, we're a ministry. We're wondering if you could do us a quick solid and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. <laughs> On Real the quick. show. <laughs> um, Personal Lord and Savior. You know, it's a quick prayer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's just say, like, I agree with the principles that Jesus advocated. Um, and th that the, you know, there's some, some, there's great wisdom in what, in, in the te teachings of, of Jesus. Uh, and I agree with those teachings. Um, and things like turn the other cheek are, are very important because as opposed to an eye for an eye. Um, an eye for an eye leads everyone blind. So forgiveness, you know, is important and um, treating people as you would wish to be treated. Love thy neighbor as thyself, very important. So it's like a 60, 70 percent, as, yes? <laughs> as Einstein would say, I believe in the God of Spinoza. Um, so, um, but hey, if um, you know, if if, if Jesus is is uh, saving people, I mean, I, I I wouldn't stand in his way. You know, like I'll be sure, I'll be saved. Why not? Sweet, we did it. Yeah. I think he just said yes. We got him. <laughs> All right. We got him. Yes. We got him. Sounds good. Now watch this. What's your thoughts on the afterlife? I think that our souls really do go somewhere else into this dimension that we possibly may have explored, I think, through psychedelics and other forms of that type of activity. Are you talking about taking LSD to find out what's on the other side? Yeah, I'm not sure of where I go, but I know it's going to be somewhere incredible and amazing because this, our souls are too complex to only be stuck in this dimension. I know that I have faith in where I want to go and being a good person here and the way I I fulfill my life and my soul on this earth is going to really transcend where I go afterwards. So you are a good person? I like to think so, absolutely. Are you an educated person? <laughs> yes. Well read? <laughs> well read. What's the biggest selling book of all time? I don't know. It's the Bible. Oh, that would make sense, yeah. You believe the Bible? 
Uh, I believe the Bible has been rewritten so many times that at this point, I'm not sure if we even know it was written to to begin with. Now, you're sure of that? Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a game of telephone. We're constantly rewriting it and trying to translate it. And I grew up very religious. In a As very, a Christian? Yes, in a very Catholic home. My dad is a deacon, actually. Uh, Were you born again? Was I born again? Um, Do you know what that is? <laughs> No, Jesus said in John chapter 3, unless you're born again, you're not going to enter heaven. It's very, very clear, so it's important to, to be born again. When you become born again, you become a Christian, whether you're Catholic or Protestant. By being born again, you become a Christian. Are you going to make it to heaven? You're a good person. Have you kept the Ten Commandments? Uh, I don't think I need to keep the Ten Commandments in order to get into heaven, honestly. Really? I've gotten way past that with my religion and my faith in God, where I truth, truly believe that I don't need to, I can't live with my husband, my boyfriend before I marry him. And that's, I'm not going to get into heaven if I do that. So truthfully, I don't, I believe in the Ten Commandments, but I think it takes a lot more for you to get into heaven. All right, test me. Okay. I'm ready. Oh, you ready? <laughs> How many lies have you told in your life? Many. What do you call someone who's told many lies? A liar. So what are you? A liar. You still think you're a good person? I am. You ever stolen something? <laughs> yes. What do you call someone who steals? A robber. No, a thief. Thief. So what are you? Still a good person. No, what are you if you steal? A thief. A thief. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Yes. Would you use your mother's name as a cuss word? Probably not, no. Of course not. That would dishonor her. If you want to express disgust, hit your thumb with a hammer and want to say the S word, you wouldn't substitute her name in its place. That would sure. be, be a horrible thing to do. And yet you've done that with the name of God, the God that gave you life. When his name is holy, it's called blasphemy. So serious, it's punishable by death in the Old Testament. Appreciate your patience with me. This is very awkward for you and for me. I'm sorry. You can handle it? I honestly, I really enjoy that people still talk about God and have such a strong faith and come out here and talk about it. So oh, I've... that's great. You've made me feel more relaxed. So here we go. <laughs> We're bringing the cannons out now. Jesus said, if you look with lust, you commit adultery in your heart. Have you ever looked with lust? <laughs> Absolutely. Have you had sex before marriage? No, of course. Yeah. So. So I'm not going to heaven. It sounds like that heaven just doesn't want me. And that's a real big shame that because I had sex before marriage that my chances of coming, getting into heaven are limited. And I think that's a really crazy way to look at how God looks at us because overall you should be judged by your life on this earth, not because I told a lie or and I took God's name or I had sex before marriage. There's so much more that goes into your life and what you should be judged on. And if that's the way heaven's going to judge, then I don't really need to go there. Boy, that, that had a whole stack of stuff in it. I it's know, really interesting. So, so let, me, let, me, <laughs> let me address the first one, and I think it's the basis of everything. Do you know what the first of the Ten Commandments is? Oh my gosh, yes, I do. Oh, not you will not have other gods before me. Yes, it is. Yeah, you nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> And that means don't make up a God in your own image, a God that has no sense of justice or righteousness or truth. I did before I was a Christian. I had a God that I snuggled up to and used to pray to every night, but he was a figment of my imagination, the, shape, the place of imagery. I had an image of God that was erroneous. And from there, I said, well, God doesn't care about right or wrong or fornication or blasphemy or lying or stealing it. You, we do. We'll chase a man to the end of the earth if he's violated the law, if he's seriously done something wrong. That's because we're made in God's image. So the God of the Bible does care about right and wrong. And so back to the question, on Judgment Day, seeing you're a self-admitted, lying, thieving, blasphemous, fornicating, adulterer at heart, wow. will you be innocent or guilty if he judges you by the Ten Commandments? Totally guilty. Heaven or hell? I'm going to hell. Now, does that concern you? You know, it used to when I was younger. And as I got older and like really just sat, sat with myself, and was able to make my own choices about God, I learned that I don't have to do everything that the Ten Commandments say. I grew up super religious, and I, try, I question my parents now, too, and hearing a lot of the things that my parents follow and the way that, how closed-minded they are, it really just pushes me further away from... Well, Gerardo, I'm not a Catholic. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you something a little different from sure. Catholicism, so if you could be patient with me. It horrifies me, the thought of you ending up in hell. I've just met you, but I care about you, and the thought of you ending up in hell breaks my heart. Now, do you know what the Bible says death actually is? There's a Bible. Yeah, it says death is wages. Did you know that? Is what? Wages. 
wages. Yeah, God is paying you in death for your sins. It's like a judge. Court of law sees a heinous criminal that's murdered three young ladies. He says, we're going to pay you in the death sentence. This is your wages. This is what's due to you. This is what you've earned. And we think lightly of sin. Who didn't lie and steal and fornicate and all that? But God says, because he's holy, that sin is so serious, he's given you capital punishment. Death is evidence that God is serious about sin. And you said before the Bible's changed. You know, I've been reading it every day without fail for about 48 years, and I've never found a mistake in it. I can go back, I can go back to the original Greek and Hebrew. There's no changes. They've been very diligent. And this whole phone conversation, you know, that phone game, that's okay if the person who said the message follows the phone all the way through so it doesn't change. And that's what God has done with his word. He's honored his word. He's kept his word. It hasn't changed. So tell me, brought up a Catholic, see if you know what God did for guilty sinners so we wouldn't have to go to hell. Do you know? He died. He suffered and died on the cross. Yeah. Now, most people know that, but it doesn't mean much to them because they don't understand one important thought. Let me share it with you and get your thoughts. The Ten Commandments are called the moral law. You and I broke the law, Jesus paid the fine. That's what happened on that cross. That's why he said, it is finished, just before he died. To Rhoda, that's a weird thing to say before you die, it is finished. But he was saying the debt has been paid. We broke God's law, Jesus paid the fine. If you're in court and someone pays your fine, a judge can legally let you go. He can say, look, there's a stack of speeding fines here. It's serious, but someone's paid him, you're out of here. And he, can do that, and he can do that, which is legal. And God can legally dismiss your case, take the death sentence off you, let you walk, guilty though you are, and grant you everlasting life as a free gift, not because you're good, but because he's good, rich in mercy, and, a, and he provided to save you, paid our fine in our stead. And then Jesus rose from the dead and defeated death, and if you will simply repent of your sins, don't confess them to a priest, go straight to God and say, I've done things I know are abhorrent to you that are worthy of the death sentence. I ask you to forgive me, cleanse me. That's genuine repentance. And then trust in Jesus like you trust a parachute. If you're on a plane 10,000 feet up and you didn't put a parachute on, you're gonna perish. But the parachute will be put on because you know you're in danger. That's why people put parachutes on because they know they're gonna hit the ground 120 miles an hour. And what I've tried to do with you today is put the fear of God in you because I know the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom and fear in that sense that makes you put on a parachute is actually good, it's doing you a favor. And fear in this sense, realizing your salvation is at stake, will cause fear to cause you to get right with God and say, I have sinned against you. So please don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I know there's a lot of bathwater with Catholicism and all religion, <laughs> but underneath it, there's a real baby Everlasting life is a free gift of God, and you've been so patient with me. Here's me rattling on, and you didn't butt in, but you listen, and I really appreciate that. You're going to think about what we talked about? I always do. I always like to listen and take it all in because you can only become a wiser and stronger person if you listen to others, others who do the research and others who read the Bible down the line. So I appreciate your time, too, and pulling well, I'm me I'm honored that you have listened, uh, and you're going to think about it seriously? Let's rock and roll, yeah. Yeah, you know why I say the word seriously? It's because you don't know when you're going to die. It could be tonight in your sleep. It could be on the way home. 150,000 people die every 24 hours. So think about it and think about the words of Jesus. What shall it profit a man? And that means a woman too. If he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. Your, your life is so precious. And yeah. so think about it with that sense of urgency. I'd like to give you a book that I've written. Is that okay? Sure, thanks. Okay. Let me grab it. Okay. Do you think you'll read it? Cool. Um, I will read it. What did you say about it being interesting? <laughs> um, it's interesting that you come out and you have you have conversations with people for, with people who actually want to listen. And you enjoyed it. I do, and I, I appreciate that you feel so strongly about your belief, and you want to come out here and you want to let everybody know. So thanks for being here. Don't forget to subscribe and click on the notification bell, and make sure you don't miss the Living Waters podcast. The Evidence Study Bible will give you everything you've ever wanted to know about subjects such as the theory of evolution, as well as valuable information about cults and different religions, atheism, and biblical archaeology. It also contains hundreds of quality quotes, fascinating articles, amazing scientific facts in the Bible, and so much more. It even includes answers to 200 of the most commonly asked questions of the Christian faith. The Evidence Study Bible will thoroughly enrich your trust in God and in His precious Word. Get yours at livingwaters.com.
Approaching a stranger is a little bit scary for most of us. That's why we've produced the Starter Kit. It contains four of our most popular gospel tracks. This is 101 of the world's funniest one-liners. These really are funny, and the gospel is hidden way inside. It's so easy to give out. You simply say, this is 101 of the world's funniest one-liners. It'll cheer up your day. This is the good person test. It's exactly what I say to people in comic form. And who can resist a comic? This is the Ten Commandments coin with a gospel on the back. I tossed a handful to teenagers once on a sidewalk and watched them fight over them. It's a great gift to give to anyone. And of course, our ever popular million dollar bill. Just say, did you get your million? And watch people's faces light up. There's a total of 350 tracks in the starter kit. Get yours today at livingwaters.com.